welcome back to the show. Thank you, Rania, for having me. Well, I'm really, I'm looking forward to having this conversation with you. Um, there's a lot to talk about, and I appreciate the fact that we can have a very nuanced uh, conversation like this here. So to start off, can you just explain from, from the, you know, we're hearing from different sides of this issue, what happened to Masa Amini that we do know, and then what are the claims from different sides? And of course, I'm speaking of the woman whose death in custody has sparked weeks of protest. Uh, and then we can go from there. Um, sure. So uh, Mahsa Amini was a 22-year-old Iranian woman uh, from the Kurdistan province uh, in Iran. And she was visiting Tehran, uh, I believe, with her family. And at some point, she's uh, taken into custody by the guidance patrol, uh, what is in Persian in the popular culture is called Gashta uh, Irshad, which literally translates to uh, guidance patrol. Uh, although in the in the Western media you often hear the the uh, the phrase uh, morality police, but I don't think morality po po police captures uh, the idea of uh, Gashda Irshad well, because in in the Iranian cognition the uh, distinction between legality and morality that you had in the European legal tradition uh, didn't really occur in the same way. So I don't I don't like to use the word morality police, but in the in the media you often hear that term. Uh, morality police, but throughout the program, I will I will refer to it as the as, as the guidance patrol or Gashda Irshad, and and this guidance patrol is actually under the purview of the uh, police organization or what in Persian is called Nirui and Tezami, and their task is to uh, enforce hijab, and so they and a lot of times it's very arbitrary, but you know they they look at uh, women's wardrobe and what they judge to be bad hijabi or or poor hijab, they take them into custody and they provide a citation to them. And uh, what happened to Mahsa was she was actually at the Haqqani metro station. And the Haqqani metro station is actually in a relatively wealthy part of Tehran. Uh, so in Tehran, how the geography works is that if you go from uh, south to north, uh, it usually gets more wealthy. And Haqqani is situated towards the north of the city. Uh, and there's a, and the, the uh, Tehran metro system is very comprehensive. And there's a station uh, in, in Haqqani. Um, and then she was uh, taken into custody uh, at Haqqani Metro Station. Um, and then she goes to the office where she's supposed, supposed to be cited in Wazara, and that's where she collapses. And so we have two different narratives here, the, the foreign media, the English language media, and also the uh, Persian media that's coming out of uh, you know, places like London and New York and, and Berlin and so on. Uh, their claim was that uh, she was beaten, and their evidence is that uh, there were eye eyewitnesses, and also based on the Twitter photos of her in the hospital, they're, they're claiming that she was beaten, and this led to her death. Uh, and this is also on Wikipedia. So if you go on Wikipedia in English and Persian, on both versions, they're citing to uh, the uh, Western media and also the Western-funded uh, Iranian media to claim that uh, she was beaten, and the beating was the reason for her death. But then if you look at the Iranian media, the Iranian media is claiming through uh, the uh, the Pezeshke Qanuni or foren the forensic doctor. So the Modira Kulle Pezeshke Qanuni at Tehran, which translates as the uh, Tehran director for forensics. His conclusion was that uh, Mahsa Amini had underlying diseases that caused her death. So she wasn't beaten. Uh, rather, the, there are certain uh, diseases that she had documented in the medical system, including uh, brain tumor surgery that she did at, at the age of eight, and that caused her to uh, uh, collapse and then eventually pass away in the hospital. And they also claim, uh, the Iranian authorities claim that there's no evidence of beating, and they also released uh, video footage uh, where she gets into the van, um, and then she gets out of the van, goes to the station, and there's no beating in the video. Um, and it's possible that you know they, they edited the video or, or there's something that went missing, but this is the, 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 the story that we're getting from the Iranian uh, authorities. Um, and what the truth is, I don't know. I mean, as an, as an independent observer, um, I don't have enough resources uh, to really judge, uh, but I think time will tell that which side is telling the story, or it might be something something in the middle. But I think the bigger problem is not even the, the issue of beating, but rather the, the broader conversation that has emerged around the guidance patrol or, or the so-called uh, morality police.
And and of course, yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, this, in this case, none of us really knows. We we weren't there to see. It could be either story. It could be a mix of both. And like you said, time will tell. And before we go into the protest that this has sparked and um, and the form they've taken, I'm just you know curious. What is your position on what the West refers to as the morality police or the guidance patrol, as you're calling it? Um, sure. So I would say uh, Iranian women who actually have to deal with them are probably in the best position uh, to have a judgment on them. Uh, but my personal position is that I'm against them and they actually don't help um, the longevity of the Islamic Republic. And from, from a security and from a strategic viewpoint, it's also a problem uh, for the government of Iran. Um, and as a, as a citizen of Iran, I'm also against it. I have a lot of friends and relatives uh, who were taken uh, by them and cited uh, for what, what was perceived to be a uh, bad hijab. And, you know, I, I, had, a, I had an experience uh, one time in a Muslim country when I was going to a Mahrajan or, uh, or a festival. And uh, for, for some reason that day, you know, I was wearing a shorts that were up to my knees. And according to most uh, schools of Islamic law, you, actually men can wear shorts that come up to their knees. Uh, but for some reason, you know, they denied me entry and they said, you know, you're supposed to be wearing pants. And that experience itself was, you know, I, I, I felt uh, very uncomfortable. So I, I can I can see, you know, what women go through when they have to deal with uh, the guidance patrol. Um, but I think what's also important to mention here is that uh, if indeed there was a beating that happened against Mahsa, this is not a routine thing. So from a friends and relative, uh, numerous friends and relative who have been uh, stopped by the guidance patrol. Uh, I had never heard an account of beating uh, or anything violent towards them. And I think uh, Americans have a tendency to universalize from their own experience, and right. they probably dealt with the U.S. police, and they think that you know the police uh, everywhere acts like that. But in the case of the guidance patrol, it is not something that, at least anecdotally, I had heard before that that they beat women when they uh, take them uh, into the van for, for citations. And also another, uh, another thing that I should mention about the guidance patrol that I think is a problem is that it has a class element to it uh, because it is true that the vans are all over Tehran. And as I mentioned, the Haqqani metro station where Mahsa was taken, where Mahsa Amini was taken, that is in a relatively wealthy part of Tehran. But at the same time, you know, if you are on foot or in public transit and you're not wealthy enough to own a car, uh, you're most like you're more likely to encounter them because you know you're just on foot walking around the city and they could stop you. But if you're in your car, the chances are you will not encounter them. So there's also that class element to it that I think make the the guidance patrol or the so-called morality police even a bigger problem. Now, that's really interesting. And I do kind of want to get into some more detail about the hijab mandate in terms of like the reason it exists. But I also do want to note, I mean, this is an important conversation for Iranians to be having. But it, I mean, I, 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 it almost upsets me that we have to be having it, but we're only having it because it's become so widespread in Western media as though it's like our business. But I do appreciate you laying that out. I, I do want to ask you, though, I mean, since you follow Iranian media, you are Iranian. I'm sure you're speaking to your family there. When it comes to protests in countries that are like on America's hit list, no matter what that protest is about, no matter what sparked it, no matter how legitimate it may be, it's pretty common for the U.S. and its allies to try to use it to their advantage, to try to make it seem bigger than it is. And I'm not suggesting that these protests aren't as big as the Western media is saying they are. I have no idea. But what I want to ask you here is maybe lay out some nuance for us. So obviously there's been these protests taking place. There's no doubt we've seen video of protests. Some have been peaceful. Others have looked more like violent riots, including some violence against police, I believe, among the casualties so far from um, from this, this round of protests. Uh, many police have been killed as well. Um, as I'm, I maybe I'm not sure what the number of protesters is. I'm not really sure like what numbers to believe. I'm, you know, after watching what happened in Syria, you never know what sources to believe, right? Because everybody has an agenda. But help us understand: there are legitimate grievances here, obviously, but there's also some manipulation taking place by the West. There also are obviously some violent riots taking place. Um, so. You know, what are you reading and hearing from, I guess, relatives? What What's your take on what's happening inside? Neither of us are in the country, but you are 
in a better position than most of the rest of us are to have somewhat of an understanding of just how widespread these protests are and what they look like. That's right. So, um, I mean, I think uh, getting clear data uh, is always difficult. And even, even if you're in, in Iran right now and even participating in the protest, um, you know, you cannot see the entire country. It's not that, you know, you can go to every, every corner of the country to see what's happening. So even, even from that vantage point, uh, I think your experience would be limited. Uh, but from, from what I've been hearing and reading, um, it, it appears that they're smaller than the 2019 protests that were over the gas uh, price hikes. Um, so I think they're smaller than that. And they're also smaller than the 2009 green uh, protests uh, that uh, happened uh, in a response to uh, what the supporters are uh, of uh, Mir Hossein Mustavi uh, thought were the uh, stolen election uh, by Ahmadinejad. Um, so uh, they, they appear to be uh, a lot smaller. Uh, but regarding, uh, I mean, I think they have a legitimate uh, point, which is, you know, the protests against the uh, guidance patrol uh, and the mandate of the gu uh, guidance patrol. But what happens in a lot of uh, global South countries, especially those that are in the resistance uh, camp of things uh, against uh, U.S. imperialism, is that a lot of times they're manipulated by outside forces to go in a different direction. Uh, so, and this is what people, you know, when people always ask me, you know, what is going on over there? You know, that's a very typical uh, American question. You know, they ask a very broad, they're like, you know, well, what is going on over there? And and my response usually is that, you know, well, everyone protests, you know, you have Occupy Wall Street in this country, you have uh, the Black Lives Matter protests and so on. So when, when people think that an injustice has occurred or their rights have been violated or, you know, they're not, uh, their economic welfare is not being respected, they come on the streets and protest. But the difference is that in a country like US, you don't really have to fear major instability that results from foreign influence and foreign manipulation. Even though, I mean, they claim that Russia can bring major instability to the US, I, I haven't really been bought on that argument. But as, uh, so that's in the imperial core, but in the periphery, especially countries that are attempting to resist US imperialism, uh, the problem is that any time that there's a popular pro process, it can be manipulated uh, by the forces of empire. And I think that's something that a lot of Iranians on the streets are not very aware of because they're actually getting their information uh, from the uh, foreign funded medias. I mean, and that's actually a really good uh, segue to another question I wanted to ask you is, can you lay out for us in terms of media interference, because obviously we're seeing media in the US, we see CNN in English and we see BBC in English, but there's a whole host of media outlets funded by the West that are, you know, that Iranians are consuming inside Iran in, in, uh, in Farsi. That's right. Um, yes, yeah, so I mean, you have uh, Iran International, uh, which uh, the Guardian broke, that, broke the story on this, and the uh, uh, the claim is that it is most likely Saudi funded. Uh, so that was actually a Guardian story. Mm -hmm. And then you also have Manoto uh, that is coming uh, from from the UK. Um, and the sources of uh, funding for Manoto is not very clear. But both of those medias are very influential inside Iran. People get them through the internet and also satellites. Um, and uh, they they basically provide a, a narrative towards regime change. Uh, so that is like one of one of their uh, uh, most like pressing agendas, and they actually have a very a big audience in Iran. And there's also Voice of America that's I think less popular, but they also have uh, a big audience uh, inside Iran. And uh, what was the second part of your question? Did you? Well, no, I'm just curious, like how mm -hmm. that plays out in terms. Actually, let me add this to it. I'll add this mm -hmm. as a second part of the question. And are those media outlets? Are are you watching what they're saying? And are they, you know, I've seen some accusations from the Iranians that uh, claims that these outlets are like encouraging violence, they're encouraging rioting, and they're pushing for uh, protests that are, have, you know, legitimate reasons to exist, to they're pushing them into the camp of like demanding regime change, which is very different. I just want to point out those two things are very different. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the hijab mandate and the, you know, guidance patrol is one issue regime change is an entirely or state collapse which is what the us would like to see in iran is an entirely different thing no that's right and and so what they do is that if i mean there's there's still they still you know operate professionally so i mean they don't directly say that you know come and 
uh, change the government. But that's you know the narrative they built push people's uh, push people in that direction. Uh, and I mean, I give you uh, a, a concrete example. Actually, I have I, I know Iranians in the West, in say you know North American or, or European countries that had. Uh, uh, travel tickets to Iran in October, and they actually canceled their ticket because their story they're getting from these outlets is that you know there is an imminent revolution that is about to happen, um, and yeah, so people cancel their, their travel plans. But I think if they actually go to Iran, they see that they can uh, you know go and not have major issues, um, and. Yeah, so th there is that. And I mean, I think what's also mo more important is that even though they don't have that direct calling for, you know, regime change necessarily, um, they, they, you know, they still kind of try to report professionally. Uh, there are still major agents of misinformation. Um, and this is not just the foreign funded uh, uh, Persian media, it's also the, the Western media. And, you know, the misinformation actually has come to mean this a kind of derogatory term for the fake news that's coming from, you know, Trump supporters and the right fingers and so on. But I think the 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 uh, history is much longer. So if you actually look at Western pre uh, press from its inception, so you know, from the time that you have the printed press and colonialism going together, uh, the imperial court has always been producing misinformation about the periphery and about the colonized countries. Uh, and I give you an example again from Iran. Uh, if you look at the 1950s when Mohammad Mossadegh who was overthrown by a CIA back coup d'etat uh, when he was actually when he actually nationalized the Iranian oil um, and he was trying to move it away from British and and uh, American control if you read the British press at the time they pre they presented him as you know somebody who was intransigent uh, somebody who had dictatorial tendencies so they were creating a lot of mis uh, misinformation and also misinterpretation uh, of his uh, politics in order to sell him as this madman and to uh, generate consent for uh, the U.S. assisting uh, the Shah in, in overthrowing him. Um, so this misinformation against the periphery, against the global south, against colonized countries has a very long history and we're seeing it again. And I think it comes in three different forms. So one is that you get incorrect facts. So for example, most recently, a lot of the uh, foreign-funded Persian medias were claiming that Sayyid Ali Khamenei, the current leader of Iran, is uh, uh, very ill and he's supposed to die very soon. But I mean, I think those were rumors. And very possibly, they were generating those rumors uh, in order to create more momentum for regime change, right? Because the idea is that if he's dying, there is that momentum. So you have incorrect facts, uh, or uh, sorry, incorrect claims that are reported as facts. Um, and then also you have other things like the inflation of numbers. Um, so a lot of times they inflate uh, numbers. I think they were doing it for the for the COVID during the COVID pandemic. Uh, the, I mean the Iranian media might have been underreporting it, but then here I think they were overreporting it. Um, so you have that. But I think most problematically, uh, at least from my vantage point, because I'm a scholar of history and literature and politics is a Eurocentric interpretation that you get. So everything is kind of filtered through this Eurocentric lens, uh, whether it, it comes to gender issues, issues of sexuality, uh, the, uh, the structure of governance. So everything is subject to these Euro uh, European standards. And when, when you report in that way, and when you write your stories in that way, that also distorts uh, what is happening in the country. Um, go ahead. No, no, no. I was just, I think you're making a really excellent point uh, in that. And I just wanted to, I actually wanted to ask about exiles because there's also a lot of this coming from people who live outside of the country who have some really hawkish agendas. And I want to give some examples because they play a huge role. And I mean, this is a bit of a cartoonish example, but I think it's a, I mean, you're, you know, you're on the West Coast where a lot of really hawkish Iranian exiles live. Um, and they really, they do. There are people who do want regime change, and that tends to be the kinds of people who end up getting the most attention uh, when these kinds of things take, take place. I mean, we've seen it in, you know, the recent past in terms of Syria, the most hawkish uh, voice always got the most attention uh, when it came to like Syrian Americans or Syrians that lived in the U.S. So anyways, here's just like an example. That's this woman who was featured in this uh, New Yorker article recently. Uh, I don't know. I don't want to butcher her name. Is it Masih Alinejad? That's right. Masih oh. Alinejad. 
So she is, this is, this is her right here. I'm just like scrolling through to show her photo. People may recognize her because she's been getting a lot of attention. Um, people were actually quite angry because Dexter Filkins, who also wrote some terrible things about Syria as well, um, featured her as the one who's actually fueling the protests in Iran. This is actually a woman who doesn't even live in Iran anymore. I believe she lives in New York City, if I'm not mistaken. She does indeed, yep. And um, I, the reason I bring her up is, okay, there's this entire uh, lengthy piece uh, crediting her with these hijab protests. And in many ways, it's anti-hijab protests. And in many ways, I mean, the reason that that putting her at the center of this is so problematic that media will not mention when talking about the this issue is um, the fact that she is very much in bed with the U.S. State Department. And I'm not like... I'm not even exaggerating when I say that. So here is actually an article from Responsible Statecraft um, from, I think it was a couple of years ago, uh, but it's still very relevant today. Here's the same woman. Here she is with Mike Pompeo. She's very close with American neocons. Mike Pompeo, Pompeo isn't just an American neocon. He's actually like a Christian fundamentalist end timer who's obsessed. He's obsessed with changing the regime in Iran. I believe he him or at least his colleagues often speak at like MEK funded uh, stuff. But what's important to note here is that this was back in 2020. And in 2020, she had already received more than $305,000 in contracts for her work at Voice of America Persia between 2015 and 2019. And that was back in 2020. Um, I, I mean, I, I haven't looked into what she's been doing since then, but she's still very much, you know, promoting the idea that we should overthrow the Iranian government and any protest that takes place in Iran anytime, anywhere. She immediately takes it from that protest, no matter how legitimate it might be, to this is why we need to overthrow the government of Iran, sanction it, and bomb it. Um, and so these are the kinds of people uh, that we're dealing with when it comes to these sorts of like exiles. So I don't know. I'm just curious if you want to react to that at all before I, I move on to the next question I have for you. Yeah, and I mean, and so this is how empires, uh, you know, sustain uh, themselves that also uh, try to sabotage countries that are oppositional to them. You know, they have a fifth column where they have these oppositional exiles in the imperial core that produces the imperialist propaganda against their home countries and also what, what is also referred to as a native informant. Uh, so there are a lot of these na native informants working, you know, across think tanks, universities, journalists, and so on, uh, operating out of uh, the US and Europe. Um, and, and yeah, so, I mean, their politics is often very much intertwined with regime change. And sometimes, you know, like Masih Adinejad is more an example of like a hard regime changer. So they're, they're more hard, but they're also the soft ones um, that uh, still advocate for regime change to some extent. And what's interesting is also there's a big industry for the Masih Ali Najat types. And, you know, uh, funnily, her, her her first name Masih actually means uh, savior. Um, so I think she, she has this perception of herself as the savior of the Iranian people, even though a lot of times, I think the Song Republic actually reacts to her activism. So if there are things that are happening organically in the country and the Song Republic backs down and relaxes some of the hijab laws, when they see the Masih Ali Najat types that actually go in overdrive and react to that in a sense. So I think uh, if anything, a lot of times they're ineffective uh, for, for the progressive movements in the country. Um, but yeah, so there, there's a whole industry here for them too. Uh, and, you know, a good example is the book production. So if you look at people uh, who have been in prison in Iran, whether the Iranians themselves or dual nationals or outright foreigners, when they come back to the West, they always have these lucrative contracts to write books about how you know oppressive and repressive uh, Iran was, and there's a big market for that. So whether it's the the prison, um, the Evin, we can call it the Evin industry uh, book production, or whether you know it's uh, talking about oppression or repression in the country in other ways, there's a big industry, and uh, I think these exilic uh, intellectuals um, and journalists and pundits. Uh, really have a big audience and they work in collaboration with the government and think tanks to produce this, this information. And then there's also the issue of, um, you know, there's a few elements here. You mentioned there's like this industry, right? So it's like a career path. I mean, I know, for example, as a Lebanese American woman, tomorrow, if I started hating Hezbollah, I could get all kinds of jobs. I could probably get a job at some like, you know, 
uh, think tank in D.C. to just my entire job would just be to make things up about Hezbollah and say how awful they are. So it's it's a great I mean, it's a great way to make a career for yourself on the one hand. But also there are people with agendas. And I here specifically, I want to ask you about uh, two types of people. There's the MEK, right, the MEK types who support what used to be listed as a terrorist group until Hillary Clinton's State Department was lobbied to take them off the terrorist group list. And then there's also the pro Shah elements, people who literally want to bring back uh, the Shah uh, and reimpose that authoritarian dictatorship on Iran. So can you like talk a little bit about those two elements and have you been seeing like them reacting to or trying to use these protests to their advantage? That's right. Um, so yeah, so what happens is that a lot of times uh, the MEK and the royalists uh, kind of jump on these protests and whether it's through their media or through their actual uh, presence uh, during the protests. So, I mean, I think in uh, California, there were a bunch of uh, protests uh, arranged and not, not just California, all over the West. And a lot of these well-intentioned university students uh, go to the protests. But then what, what ends up happening is that uh, all the uh, MEK people and the royals also show up. So it becomes this weird mixture. And even, even if, you know, the protesters are not going there with the aim of regime change, what ends up happening is that a lot of the people who show up who have links or ideological sympathy with the with the likes of MEK and the royalists, they also show up and then it turns into a, a regime change uh, type protest. Uh, and if you're uh, curious about the MEK and, and their origins, uh, there's a really a great book written by my own teacher, Ervan Abrahimian, called The Iranian Mujahideen. Uh, and he kind of traces the history because in, in the 1960s, there were actually an oppositional group uh, against the Shah and they helped bring about the revolution. But when the revolution happened, they they had differences with the Islamic Republican Party and they were not able to consolidate power unlike the Islamic Republican Party. And then eventually they operated out of exile. And now they're actually uh, stationed in Albania. They used to be in Iraq, mm -hmm. but now they're, they're in Albania for reasons I haven't really understood. Uh, but then they also operate uh, from from other countries as well, and like you mentioned, you know they have collaborated with the Americans, and they're one of the the I, I, get, I think the most organized uh, groupings, and they also, with the aid of uh, Israel, they um, carry out assassinations against Iranian scientists and so on inside the country, um, and then the the royalists, I mean they're the proponents of the return of uh, Valiyat or the Crown Prince uh, Reza Pahlavi, who lives in in the U.S. Uh, but you know, ironically, or, or uh, I guess it's, it's a big uh, contradiction. Reza Pahlavi himself is actually not for monarchy. He supports constitutional monarchy, so he just wants to be a ceremonial figurehead and have you know a, a republic. Uh, so some of his supporters, you know, actually go to him and they're they're they're, uh, they, they're kind of confused by this, right? And I mean, maybe he's not sincere. Maybe he actually wants to become a king. But at least in the in his public uh, uh, face, um, he always talks about a constitutional monarchy. But then the royalists uh, who support him, they, they, they kind of see, they want a revival of the Pahlavi monarchy and they think that the only uh, right form of government for Iran is, is the monarchy. Um, and I think the support for them is exaggerated because if you talk to a lot of Iranians, uh, again, in California, they would tell you that they're very popular and Reza Pahlavi is very popular in Iran and if he returns, you know, he will become either the monarch or the constitutional monarch. But I haven't seen much evidence for that. Um, I think he, he has lost his, his, he doesn't have that level of popularity uh, to ever be uh, able to revive the Pahlavi monarchy. And of course, in all this, I mean, what, what are all these people advocating for? At the end of the day, you hear a few common themes and not everybody. I mean, I know there are some people um, who really just want women to have a choice and that's totally fair. And I get that and I'm, I'm, I'm for that. Um, but a lot of this ends up turning into we want more sanctions on Iran. And that's exactly what we're seeing happening right now. You see the Germans have announced that they're going to add san more sanctions on Iran. Uh, the Canadian foreign minister, who I believe is like the granddaughter of a Nazi, um, <laughs> Christia Friedland, uh, has stated that, uh, that Canada is going to add. Interestingly enough, she talked about the women's rights and then said that that's why we're going to sanction more IRGC figures. But as far as I know, the IRGC does not 
police women. <laughs> you can correct me if I'm wrong on that, but the, it just it just shows that that's where they're taking this. They're taking this to the to to a foreign policy goal of there's protests in Iran over women's rights. Therefore, let's sanction the Iranian government because we're sick of them supporting resistance in the Middle East, which two things that have nothing to do with each other. But my question for you is for all those people who think that um, who are seeing this response of sanctions. Why are sanctions, if you actually care about women's rights in Iran, the wrong way to respond to this? Do sanctions on Iran help Iranian women? I mean, I think that answer is obvious, but please take it from there. No, no, and I think you're right. And and that's the other thing is this kind of, uh, they don't even have the right comprehension or understanding of Iranian politics. Um, so, you know, they could be sanctioning the, the wrong people. And also the, the way the sanctions work is that uh, they become this like they they target everything. So a lot of times, uh, Iranians like uh, for example, Iranians couldn't even uh, access Zoom uh, when during the pandemic. If they wanted to interact, say with Zoom, uh, Zoom had blocked access because of the sanctions. Even though I think most recently the Biden administration uh, got uh, allowed these uh, companies uh, such as Zoom to actually uh, have their uh, you know give a business to Iranian IPs. Not that they actually transact with money, but then if you open the Zoom application, you can actually access it. But before that, you have to run a VPN to actually access mm -hmm. Zoom. Um, so yeah, the, the 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 sanctions actually harm uh, ordinary Iranians, as you're mentioning, and also a lot of times they're confused and they're they're too too broad, too uh, too total. Um, and also, I think what they do at the end of the day is that this kind of media discourse, uh, this so-called this supposed human rights discourse is actually linked to the sanctions. So when you actually you have uh, uh, this supposed uh, rights discourse coming from uh, a lot of the Western media, what happens after that is the sanctions, right? So these these two work together. Um, and I mean, I think international pressure can be very effective in a lot of contexts. So say apartheid South, South Africa or apartheid Israel. So I think the, the countries that are in some ways allied with the imperial core uh, where you know they don't have the prospect of regime change and major instability in the same sense. Sometimes international pressure works to actually advance progressive agenda. But in the case of Iran, I think the the sanctions um, and the pressure from the so-called international community, which is just you know the West and Israel and maybe Japan, uh, what it does is actually uh, delegitimizes the progressive movements and also uh, obstructs their movement towards something better. That's a really good point about delegitimizing progressive movements. And I'm actually going to get to that too, but I think it's a, actually a good uh, sort of pivot point to talking a bit about the actual reality in Iran. Um, since you are Iranian yourself, you've lived in Iran um, and you understand Iran and you've also studied Iran. Um, so can you tell us to what extent are women involved in public life in Iran? And here I'm talking about in politics. Are, are there women members of parliament? Are there women ministers? Are there women nuclear engineers? Um, and I'm not asking this so you'll say, yes, everything in Iran is great for women. Just a genuine curiosity about, you know, the role of women in public life in this country that everybody seems to think they're experts on. <laughs> That's right. Um, so uh, historically, uh, not just in Iran, but in the in the Muslim uh, world more more broadly. So if you look at pre-modernity and before modernization reforms, so pre 20th century, uh, women were oftentimes tied tied to the home. So they actually own property and they also own businesses. But usually it was uh, that uh, it was stationary. So it had to be tied to the household where they would also take care of the domestic needs of the family. So they had a lot of uh, stationary businesses such as uh, textile industry and textile production. And the men dealt with things that, that moved and also dealt with the, the purchase and the sale of uh, real estate and so on. Uh, but then what happens after modernization reform, um, uh, including in Iran, is that women gain much greater mobility um, and then they 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 start entering uh, professions that were historically reserved for men, right? And then uh, today in Iran, so I mean this this happens under the Pahlavis, under the Pahlavi modernization program. But when the Islamic Revolution happens, uh, you know they don't go back they they don't go back to pre modernity, right? So they don't try to revive the traditional patterns of economy and mobility and so on. So they maintain the Pahlavi modernization in a sense, 
And a lot of women start attending, uh, uh, more women uh, compared to the Pahlavi period start attending schools and universities and so on. And today, based on some of the data I've seen, uh, and the data varies, but based on the data I've seen, it appears that the majority of uh, STEM graduates, so university graduates in the STEM fields are actually women. So there are more women in Iran graduating, getting degrees uh, in the STEM fields compared to the men. Um, and also, uh, again, going back to your question about the, the public presence, even though the veiling um, has imposed certain controls and has limited the choice of women uh, in certain contexts and for certain social groups, um, it has also legitimized their public presence and their political agency in a sense that before the veiling and before the revolution, the, the, the conservative establishment had an excuse that, well, you're not veiled, so you cannot come to public life. But after the, the veiling happens, uh, more people become accepting of women actually participating in public life because the idea is that they're following the Islamic dress code. So, so now we have a higher acceptance of them being in the public sphere. And there's actually really good work done on this by, because I'm, I'm actually not a scholar of gender and sexuality. Um, so I'm just kind of uh, uh, telling um, my own take. But if you, uh, there's good scholarship on this done by Shahla Ha'eri, who I think she teaches out of Boston. And she looks at the, the relationship between how veiling uh, has actually produced greater uh, public presence uh, for women. Uh, and then when it comes to positions of power, I mean, I, I did mention that we have a lot of STEM graduates uh, in Iran who are women. But then positions of power, uh, so poli especially in politics, uh, most they're mostly dominated by men, as is the case in most other places in the world. It's mm -hmm. usually men who have uh, the highest authorities when it comes to business and politics and so on. Uh, so that's still true, um, despite women, you know, uh, getting a, a higher education and a STEM education. Uh, but then when you actually live in Iran and work there. Uh, it, so even though men are, you know, officially they have the, the higher titles, a lot of times you feel like the women are running the shows. So if you, you know, the, dealing with the bureaucracy, you know, going to an office uh, in, in, the, in the workplace, um, it, it feels like the women, even though they're, they might be managing things from the bottom, they still have this very fierce attitude that, you know, they don't take uh, crap from men and they, they, they seem very strong and it seems like they're running the show if you actually live there and work there. No, that's really interesting. And I mean, even in the US, there's a struggle with uh, representation of women in politics, even uh, certainly in STEM. Um, that does That's a pretty universal issue. That's not to absolve any country uh, of not having equal representation. But, you know, I'm also curious, why, why the hijab mandate? I've seen different um, arguments about this. I'm, I haven't like read too deeply. I haven't like seen much academic work on the issue, but obviously the hijab mandate came into place after the Islamic revolution um, of 1979. What was the reasoning for this? Is it just because with, you know, Islamic law comes a hijab mandate? Was there a class element to this? Was there an identity element to this? Um, like what, what was the reason back then? That's right. Now, that's a great question. And I think class and identity are both relevant. Uh, but uh, in order to understand the Islamic Republic's uh, laws on mandatory veiling, uh, I think some history is important to understand what they were reacting to. Um, and so if, if you look at pre-modern Iran, and so pre-modern Iranian history is usually categorized as before 1906, because in 1906, Iranians had what was called a constitutional movement or a constitutional revolution that was demanding a constitutional monarch and, and liberal reforms, even though the discourse around it started in the, in the late 19th century, um, the, the demand for modernization. Uh, but before this, so in the 19th century and before the uh, early 20th century, the hijab was a given, right? Similar to how now, you know, say there's no social movement to do away with baseball caps or, you know, with whatever people wear. Uh, the kind of the idea that, you know, I don't want to wear the hijab was just not there. The hijab was a given, was part of the fabric of society and part of, you know, the way women dress. Um, and there was no challenge to it. There was no social movement or literary movement challenging it uh, before uh, the uh, late 19th century. Um, the, so the earliest challenges that you see to the hijab in the Iranian context is the, from the Babi movement that was a messianic and reformist movement in the middle 
uh, to the to the late 19th century, and you see some opposition uh, to veiling uh, in that movement. But it really takes off during the constitutional movement of 1906 that I mentioned. And you also have a lot of women's associations, uh, schools, and journals that are dealing with women's issues that emerge during the constitutional movement, and they kind of grow uh, by the 1920s. And some of their demands includes uh, the modernization of the dress code, that they want to change uh, how women uh, uh, used to dress. Uh, but then what, what happens is that when it really takes off and it goes from the civil and social level to the state and political level is in the 1930s. And so the first Pahlavi monarch, uh, Reza, uh, Reza Shah, uh, who was the father of Mohammad Reza Shah, who you was supported, and he ruled from 1953 to 1979. So the father ruled from uh, 1921 uh, to 1941. Um, and then in the 1930s, so from 1936 to 1941, uh, he actually has a, a, a unveiling mandates. So his, his policy was that in order to become more like the West, and in order to become uh, supposedly progressive, the Iranian women have to take off their hijab. Right? So he even went beyond the constitutional movement, because for the constitutionalists, it was supposed to be a choice, right? The idea was that, you know, well, uh, uh, the, the women should have the ability to choose what they wear. But with Reza Shah, the idea was that you should unveil completely in order to be supposedly progressive. Uh, and I'll give you uh, an example of what he did. So he used his police force, including physical force, to, in, uh, to enforce the unveiling mandates. Wow. And also used, he used, yeah, and then he used other coercive measures. So in the, the spring of 1935, he uh, pushed the Ministry of Education, Vizarat Ma'arev, to enact regulation that barred uh, girls who, who wore the veil from receiving their diplomas. And also if the teachers were wearing the veils, they could not receive their salary, right? So it was that that coercive. Uh, and then there were actually a lot of protests organized by the ulama or the clergy in cities like Mashhad, that was a holy city hosting the shrine of the eighth Shia Imam. And those, there were, there were protests by the state, I'm oh, sorry, there were raids on the protests by the state breaking them down. Right, so a lot of coercive measures in order to enforce the unveiling law, or rather unveiling a uh, rule because it, it wasn't actually passed in uh, legislation at the time. And this was actually in sharp contrast to Ataturk, uh, the, the, the reformer from Turkey, because the Turkish police actually never forced the unveiling, rather Ataturk had discouraged veiling and it was only banned for women who work in the public sector, right? So similar to the, the French case uh, with Ataturk, uh, he just didn't want women such as teachers in the public uh, schools to wear the veil, right? But then he did not have a police force that would go and force people or women from, from uh, taking the, the veil off. And so the, the population was actually largely opposed to what Reza Shah did. Uh, and I think part of, you know, it really like that trauma from what Reza Shah had done kind of continued. And then when the clergy uh, got power in 1980, in the 1980s, they reacted to that and they imposed uh, the mandatory veiling. Um, and you know, I, I'll give you one interesting example from how uh, traumatic it was for the Iranian population in the 1930s where they had to unveil uh, that women did not want to be seen in public without the veil. So a lot of times when they wanted to go outside, their husbands would put them in a large bag or some sort of transit where they would not be seen and then take them out. And there are examples of actually a man carrying his wife in a in a large bag, uh, so put it, so pretending that he's just carrying goods in order to take her to the public bath. Because in the 1930s, a lot of households did not have showers, right? So you have to go to the public bath mm. in order to take a shower. And so the women would be put in bags uh, and taken by their husbands to the public bath because the women did not want the women themselves they did not want to be seen in public without their whale. Um, and then so the Islamic Republic reacts to this in the 1980s and imposes these rules on, on mandatory bailing, the very opposite of Reza Shah. And the problem is it became attached to the identity of the revolution and the identity of the Islamic Republic. And so now if they want to take it off, the idea becomes that, oh, we, we appear weak uh, when the West looks at us. So, so it has become the... Especially when like the enemy West is the one demanding it, right? Like when the enemy West is making it like a Western cause. Um, that's really interesting. I was not aware of that history at all. I just always, I guess, I think a lot of people just assume that part of it was, obviously it was religious revolution. So part of it was based in religion, but then also just like an ant, it, it, it kind of is anti-Western, but like an anti-Western 
we don't want to be like the West thing. Um, but, you know, can you also just like maybe give us an idea your last trip to Iran when you when you're in public spaces and restaurants? What like, I, you know, we've often heard I know it's different depending on geographically where you are in Iran, whether a place is maybe a little bit more liberal, a little bit more conservative. But the sort of image that you see of, a, of you know, a typical woman in, in Tehran is of like a veil that's like kind of, you know, a little bit below her hair, right? So like her hair is somewhat showing. It's almost like a style. So I'm just curious, like, what's it like? Is it just a hint of a scarf or sometimes no scarf? Or is every woman always veiled? And like how widespread is the sort of citation process as far as you've observed? Obviously, I understand you're not in a woman, so you're not in a position to speak from your own experience, but being in Iran. That's right. Um, yeah, so uh, you're, you're right. So, I mean, a lot of women, they just wear a shawl and you can see, you know, their hair and, you know, their neck and everything. And they, a lot of them don't even wear an overcoat. They just wear a long blouse with jeans. Um, so if, say, you know, a Muslim woman uh, who observes uh, hijab uh, laws comes and sees them, they, they might think that it's not, you know, they're not really wearing the hijab, right? Mm -hmm. And again, for the, uh, in a lot of contexts, it's tolerated. So, you know, if you're at cafes, uh, libraries, especially more intellectual spaces, uh, you see women just, you know, like you said, wearing this scarf, uh, you know, down, like sometimes it's just like fallen and you can see, you know, the whole hair and everything. Um, and yeah, so uh, there is that. And then, you know, the, the guidance patrol, it's not like they target every, it's similar to masking rules, you know, during COVID. I mean, the mm -hmm. thing was, it wasn't like, you know, everybody would be kicked out of the establishment for not having a mask. Or, I mean, in some countries, I heard the police would actually cite people, but usually, you know, if you didn't have a mask on, uh, you know, a lot of times like you could get away with it, right? So it's similar in Iran with the hijab laws is that a lot of times they're not enforced. And, you know, the guidance patrol only has so many resources um to enforce it so uh, a lot of times like you said uh the the hijab is is not worn according to the law um and also i think what's interesting is we also have to look at it uh again bringing it back to the issue of modernization and colonial modernity is that the very form of hijab uh, its identity and the way it looks has changed uh, in the 20th century because if you look at before modernization in the 19th century uh, Iranian women in the urban spaces wore what was called a chador, which is a loose uh, sleeveless piece of cloth that covers the whole body. Mm -hmm. uh, and then piche, uh, a piche or a picha, uh, which was like a neqab or something that covered uh, you know, their face. So that's what they wore. But then starting in 1920s, the piche actually kind of falls from uh, people don't wear it anymore. They just wear the chador. And then what happens after the revolution is that the black chador, so you've seen it you know, on TV, probably when they're talking about the Revolutionary Guard, they also show women in the black chador. That became the sign of supposed piety after the revolution. So the idea was that if you're wearing the black chador, uh, you're the most pious, you're the most revolutionary. Uh, sometimes you know, the, the, the two were separated, but the black chador became a sign of supposed piety. And then on the other on the other side, the, the the very opposite of it is that women who only wear a shawl and a blouse with jeans, uh, and usually they're making a statement that I do not want to be wearing the hijab. Yeah, and then is it true that under Rouhani the morality police like virtually disappeared from life, but then were re-empowered under Raisi? And, and I know you call them the guidance patrol. I'm like using these interchangeably. Yes. No. Uh, please feel free. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, just it's just a nuance that I like to point out regarding our the concepts, but um, but yeah, you know that's I I heard that before from a lot of uh, people, but I don't think it's true because I was actually in Iran during the Rouhani administration, and there was one time where I was sitting, meeting one of my friends, and she got stopped in uh, Maidana Valias, the Valias Square, which is one of the most busiest uh, squares in the city. Um, and she was actually taken to Wazara, but then I think she just got up and left. She actually didn't get cited or anything. I don't know the, the full story, but uh, but that was in the Rouhani administration. That's one anecdotal example that I have. Um, and I remember people were still complaining about it back then. But I think rhetorically, the reformist, the Eslah Talab uh, side is a little bit more likely to oppose it and say, you know, this is not right. And I think Rouhani had this speech that said you cannot 
uh, forcibly take people to heaven. And I think he was referring to the guidance patrol mm. that, you know, this is just, this is just not right. Uh, I, I haven't heard Raisi say anything about it. I mean, uh, he, he did, um, uh, even after uh, the death of uh, Mahsa Amini, I'm not sure if he said anything about it, uh, that that was oppositional. Uh, but I think the rhetoric, yeah, it's uh, with the principle is you don't get as much rhetoric against it. Even the Ahmadinejad also spoke against it. Uh, and also, uh, Qasem Soleimani had also spoken against it. He was really, uh, he had, yeah, he had oppositional. Uh, that's the guy. Just, us. just the guy. The the general the U.S. killed, the U.S. murdered under Trump. I will just point that out. Qasem Soleimani. That's, right. um, mm -hmm. that's interesting. I didn't know that he had spoken out against it. What did he say? Mm -hmm. um, he he said that you know these are all our uh, you know this is like one the, the Iranian nation is one big family and they can be like your sisters and your mothers. And basically, you're violating their privacy by doing this. I mean, I don't think you know use the notion of privacy, but the idea was that you know you should act, you should treat them like your sisters and your mothers. And this is not you know this kind of coercive uh, institution that takes them away and cites them is not you know it's just not not right etiquette. Well, uh, right it's, I mean, it should upset everybody that the U.S. murdered an Iranian feminist icon, it appears, on top of somebody who helped save the region from ISIS and Al-Qaeda. So you've been mentioning a few anecdotal examples, so I'm curious, what is the conversation inside Iran? Because it does sound like there are a lot of, you know, complaints about these police are annoying, maybe I don't want to wear a hijab, I don't need someone policing my clothing. Um, and I think that's a good conversation to have. Is that a common conversation inside Iran? That's right. No, that's a great question. And uh, I would say that when it comes to conversations about problems and injustices, uh, the Iranians actually do, it's a lot more dynamic than there than it is in the U.S. Because I've noticed in the U.S., uh, the, criti the so-called critical thinking and like intellectual uh, thinking usually converges with uh, state ideology, right? So, I mean, you in, in your own work, you I think you uh, exposit this very well. That you know the mainstream media, the the media that most people consume, they actually converge with state ideology. I mean, it's just like the two sides of the same coin. But in Iran, it's actually very different. In Iran, the civil society um, and the journalistic society, and also the nation, they have an oppositional approach to the to the state. Um, and what the, what happens is that if the state has a particular ideology, is pushing a particular position usually the nation tries to diverge and tries to, they're, they're very skeptical to the point that the skepticism can, you know, uh, kind of go into the conspiracy realm. But at the same time, they have this kind of, that is, that is the identity of modern Iranian nationalism, is that you take an oppositional approach to the state, as opposed to the U.S., where the nation and the state are kind of very, you know, cozy and cordial uh, with each other. And I think uh, this, uh, the, the whole idea of state-controlled Iranian media, a lot of that, that stuff is projection. I mean, it is true that there are certain medias in Iran that are close to the, the leadership or they're close to the Revolutionary Guard, um, but then they don't necessarily always parrot everything. And then there are also all, all these other medias uh, that people consume that are coming from inside Iran that have a different approach. And a lot of intellectuals and journalists uh, and academics who have a very different approach. But the thing is in the West, because I think there's still uh, going on with that old Orientalist uh, discourse of Oriental despotism. They think that, you know, in those countries, there's this despot that micromanages everything and programs everyone's brains. Whereas here, you know, they're free and they're thinking freely, uh, but I'm not convinced by that. And I think it's actually, uh, there's a lot of evidence for, for the opposite analysis. Um, and so the, there is, I think, a, a large critical discourse on the issue of hijab, and it has been going back to the past 43 years. So I mean, from the very moment that the Song Republic imposed laws on mandatory veiling, there was opposition to it. And there's still conversations happening, even from inside the clergy. So there are members of the, the clergy who might, who might be opposed to it too. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I, I think one, one important point about the, the critical discourse is that it can also go really far in a se sense that there's this idea of self-misery in Iran or bad okay. that goes, yeah, so uh, it's uh, the, the Persian word for this bad bakhti, and it goes back to, again, the discourses of uh, late 19th century, the modernization discourses. And so the idea became that the Iranian national self is inadequate and inferior compared to the outside world, in particular, the colonialist West. 
right? And the, the, the discourse is so powerful that it's a really, it's really an institutionalized way of thinking. So it's mutually comprehensible between Iranians. So, you know, if you're just going to the store to buy some fruits, or, you know, you're going to the gas station, you're talking to your Iranian peers, uh, Iranian uh, countrymen and women, uh, you can be like, oh, you know, everything is going to crap. Everything is, you know, terrible here. And they agree with you. You know, there's this kind of uh, internal conversation that happens. Uh, I would say, I would compare it to the, the discourse of freedom in the U.S. So I think mm -hmm. Americans have this notion that they're free. as a false notion, but they have this false notion of freedom that's very institutionalized, you know, like the, I, the, the narrative on liberty and freedom and so on. But in Iran, it's actually a narrative on self-immiseration that has been institutionalized. And even though the government does not push it, when it comes to Iranian social, uh, social life, it's very central. And uh, I think that that kind of goes into the internal conversation and also turns into protest, right? And it has a good element because it holds power accountable, but I think on the negative side, it becomes a little bit destructive because anything that the revolution has achieved, a lot of Iranians who are kind of operating under this discourse, they dismiss. So, you know, I could be talking right. to, uh, you know, my friends or, you know, the, again, the fruit seller or the bodega guy. And I talk about, you know, the revolution has achieved all these things and you have all these things in Iran that you might not have in other countries because they're dependent on the imperial core and they just don't get it. You know, they go back to the discourse of misery and they say, well, no, we are, we are actually very miserable here. Right. And then that discourse of misery goes to the protest and then uh. it goes into, um, the idea of this discontent. You know what it really does? I mean, look, every country has its internal problems, whether it's in the imperial core or whether it's in the global south. And even if it's a country that promotes, you know, resistance to imperialism, obviously there's a lot of contradictions inside those kinds of countries as well. And it's really unfortunate that that the constant interference and the constant desire of the imperialist countries to utilize anything to their advantage to destabilize any country they hate um, makes it or becomes this huge obstacle for anything organic or legitimate to like, to, you know, to actually work. Does this lead to a conclusion of protest? Can, can protests ever work in a country like Iran when it's immediately manipulated by the West for the purposes of regime change? Um, I mean, I feel really depressed about the fact that maybe it can't be. And even you were talking about how because of the West taking this issue and turning it into a regime change issue, it becomes even less likely that something like a hijab mandate will be removed. That's right. Yeah. And I mean, I think that goes back to that issue of international pressure. To what extent is the international moralizing and the international solidarity effective? Uh, in a country like Iran that's so vulnerable to regime change. Um, and I mean, I, th I think it's it's a very difficult issue. And uh, one of your other guests, uh, Joseph Mas'ad, uh, has done really good work on this issue when it comes to the issue of sexuality. Um, so how, what he calls a gay international, actually in its attempt to have solidarity with alternative expressions of sexuality in the Arab world, um, actually produces problems for these alternative sexualities. Um, right, so it's this, this idea that you export the social movements in the West uh, elsewhere in the world, and what ends up happening is that it, it doesn't help uh, for those countries to have their own indigenous progression towards something better, mm. right? And uh, it's not just the gay international, I think you also have it with the issues of gender, politics, economics, right? And I mean, in, in, in the, the last time I spoke to you, I was trying to give the, the kind of the uh, concept of a theocratic democracy and say, well, in the Iranian context, these, the, these, these two things can work together. But if you approach it from the European perspective or the Western perspective, it doesn't, right? Mm -hmm. And then again, when it comes to sexuality and gender, we have different issues in our countries. And the problem with the, the Western approach is that they don't understand this and they try to universalize their own progressive movements, thinking that whatever you know they have achieved here, it would translate over there, but that is not the case. So I think a lot of times it's just best for the so-called international civil society to just stay quiet. Like they don't have to have an opinion on everything and they don't have to, <laughs> they don't have to export everything that they have achieved here elsewhere in the world. And I mean, if the, I mean, another crazy thing I saw with the Mahsa Amini protests is, you know, a lot of the uh, Iranian protesters were, had this slogan of be our voice. And 
uh, I don't I mean, I don't think that's a very effective approach. Mm. And when, you know, BR voice can really be uh, the, who? this kind of, yeah, exactly. But who, you know, it's, uh, like and, and also, like Rompeo, and also even even if it's you know the the more civil society elements like intellectual and journalists, a lot of times you know they're well intentioned, you know they're not like Pompeo in their intentions, but at the same time because they don't really understand the political uh, landscape and the cultural landscape, they just uh, end up universalizing their own mm. uh, supposedly progressive movements to elsewhere in the world, and that does not help. You right. have to understand. Iranian historical difference. Yeah. And of course you do see, you're right. You do see these very well-intentioned people who are like declaring their solidarity with the Iranian revolution. And I'm like, what the hell, do you know what you're saying? Like, like I just, the way, the way the word revolution so easily gets thrown around, they did this with Lebanon a few years ago too. There was like protests for a few months um, and it was a revolution. And I'm like, do you know what revolution means? Like, and do you know like what you're playing into when you say that? Like, think about what you're saying before you say it, or maybe like, I don't know if you don't know that much about a place, maybe don't, don't talk about it. I, you don't have to have an opinion on everything. You really, really don't. But you know, I do understand there's well-intentioned people out there. I want to show an example of how not to show solidarity. Um, sure. You've seen this, you've seen this before. Yeah, yeah. This is not, Let's see. So you've, you've seen this, Can oh. you, the, this image I'm showing. This yeah. is a image that is a, basically an advertisement, uh, for a 2023, a spring 2023 new gender issues in women's literature in the Middle East class that's being offered at Arizona or the University of Arizona. Um, yeah, Nick Chomsky also teaches that. Oh, okay. Oh, he teaches at yeah. the University of Arizona. Okay. So I hope yeah. he's not teaching this class. I don't no, think no, that's no, Chomsky <laughs> would teach this class. But so it says, in light, for those who are just listening, it says, in light of the killing of Masa. Amini, Iranian women's rights or women's protests and the fight for democracy as a case. And then this, I mean, it's really the cartoon that gets you. Um, I think this is a really offensive cartoon. Uh, it's like the Ayatollah and his beard is like basically over, like is, is also a hijab that's like enveloping a woman's head. And she's trying to cut the beard slash hijab off. Mm -hmm. Um, and then it just goes on to say that the course, this course usually cover this course is supposed to be a literary works course, by the way, it yeah. says that it says it's a literary works course by women written by women for women. But this year, given the extraordinary events in Iran, it will pay more attention to Iranian women's literature and their social movement. <laughs> um, anyways, I'm just curious. Yeah, your th yeah. Your thoughts on this. Can you explain why this is not yeah. how to show solidarity with Iranian women? No, I mean, it, it looks ridiculous. I mean, for, for one, um, it's, it's supposed to be an educational environment and you're offering a course and it just looks like a propaganda poster. And even the description is like this activist the kind of like uh, propaganda description. You know, say, you know, I was teaching, because uh, I do teach on colonialism, and say, so, you know, I was teaching a course on colonialism and like British colonialism. I wouldn't have a caricature of the queen, you know, as, the, as a class poster, you know, because I, I know that I probably have a students who might, uh, you know, who might have the wrong opinion, but they might be pro empire for some reason. They might think that British colonialism did good things for, you know, Africa and Asia, which I don't think it did. And I think through the class, I would teach them that it did not, but then I wouldn't come with that posturing. I wouldn't come with that posturing uh, that, you know, uh, making a, a caricature of the queen and it would turn, it would actually not be effective for their educational experience. And so here, I mean, we have an example of a reputable uh, university actually getting entangled uh, with these kind of regime change uh, activism that is just very, the mind boggling like looking at this. And I mean, I understand, say, you know, the professor has a particular position, say the professor really hates the Iranian government, uh, that, that has that bias, but then at least, you know, try to try to be uh, more neutral in the way you offer the class. Yeah, and I mean, a lot of these uh, points that are made in uh, on the side here that like are like bulleted about what we're gonna talk about in this course, it's all about feminism in Iran and the Middle East and in women's social life and fe and secular approach to social life. And we you know, I, I just, I mean, this was the same discourse used towards Afghanistan. And interestingly enough, towards Iraq, by the way, where women actually had a lot of rights in Iraq, more than, you know, women were, were more visible in public life in Iraq before 
2003 than after. The U.S. actually created a hellhole for women in Iraq. Um, they did the opposite of liberating women, but the discourse of feminism and women's liberation was something you you often heard from those who were advocating uh, to invade Iraq. And so yeah. this is very disturbing discourse to see from people claiming to be feminists because there's nothing feminist about sitting inside the imperial core uh, and essentially advocating regime change. Eradicating regime mm -hmm. change. Like people don't understand what regime change means. Regime change mm -hmm. doesn't mean you just take one government and switch it with the other. Regime change is nasty. It requires state collapse. It requires completely shattering a society and a civilization. Uh, and I mean, the countries that we've already done that to in just the past 20 years still haven't recovered from it. And they probably won't for the next century. Uh, so I feel like... Uh, that you know is important to to recognize, and I thought this was a really good yeah. example of how not to show solidarity. But That's I guess right. you know, if, I don't know if you want to add anything. No, uh, I was just going to say, you know, because uh, uh, you mentioned Afghanistan. One one funny thing that came to my uh, to my mind was that you know after the George Floyd, uh, the killing of George Floyd and the George Floyd protests, there was kind of like a moment for about one year where white Americans were kind of like, you know, I'm just going to step back and just be a listener and an observer. And, you know, I'm going to show my allyship and, you know, all that stuff. Uh, but then when the withdrawal from Afghanistan was happening, all that stuff got canceled, you know. So now the idea was, and I have a, you know, I have to intervene again and I have to, I'm, I'm no longer a listener, you know, I'm really a savior again. I'm a savior so. who has to talk, talk, talk and tell everyone in the rest of the world exactly how they should live and, uh, and take like, and pretend like I'm leading movements in places I've never been to, nor do I even speak the language of. I mean, it's just utterly, it's, it's I mean, it's American arrogance. It's it's imperialist arrogance, uh, even from sometimes from those who don't mean it. But I guess, you know, I think a good place to, to end on here would be maybe, you know, predictions. Where, you know, how serious are these protests and where will they go? Because, you know, from what I've seen over the last like 10 years even is, Every time there's protests in Iran, it's played up for like weeks to a month, sometimes a couple months by the by the Western media. This is our chance. This is our chance. Regime change, regime change. It's finally coming. And then it kind of disappears until the next time. Um, does this time seem different or do you kind of foresee something similar happening here? And then I guess, moreover, not to add more for you to remember, I can remind you of this if you're like, let me answer the first before I answer the second. But do you see this leading to any changes in Iran or because of everything we talked about, it's likely to just stay the way it is in terms of the, the mandate? Right. No, those are great questions. But then as a historian, I'm very reluctant to give predictions. Historians always are. It. Come on. Why are historians <laughs> like this? <laughs> no, we study the past, the past, not the, not the future. Um, just because that's it. Like think tanks do that, right? Think tanks are always like, you know, I'm going to give a prediction uh, for what will happen. <laughs> Uh, and also, I'm, I'm I'm afraid to give predictions because I'm worried of becoming a meme because their meme pages uh, like this, you know, age really well. You know, this, I'm sorry, this didn't age well. You know, so I could say something, and then in ten years, they're like, "Well, that didn't." Someone's age gonna well. clip. Someone's gonna clip the next like thirty seconds to two minutes and be like, "Naveed got it wrong." <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, but no, I mean, if I, if I had to speculate, and again, it could be a false prediction. Uh, but it seems like, I mean, they're already dying down. I mean, despite the reports that we're getting, um, and see, again, going back to the misinformation issue, uh, we, sometimes it's very difficult to know what's happening. So, I mean, uh, most recently, uh, I think today and yesterday, there were reports that the, uh, workers at the petrochemical and the oil industries mm. in South of Iran are on a strike and they have joined the protest. Uh, but then I also saw reports today that it was just a minor, uh, protests, I think, in Boucher, only the city of Boucher, not even Abadan, where some of the major refineries are. And it was a very small segment of workers who were not on contract. They were just workers who were paid by the day. And I think they were protesting because of their economic condition. And they were in, it wasn't even directly connected uh, to Mahsa Amini's death. Um, so, um, so, yeah, uh, it's not... Uh, clear you know the information we're getting um and it could be it could be that it's getting bigger but my assessment is that it's actually not getting bigger and i think that the biggest stage was la you know the the beginning of the protest the first week of the protest and now it's dying down um and uh like 2019 uh i don't think it will it will uh, lead to any major changes in the institutions of the government but regarding the guidance patrol 
uh, that's something that we have to wait and see what happens. But I think, again, because of how politicized it is and how the, I, the, the whole discourse and the whole politics around it is threatening the identity of the Song Republic, they will not really uh, let go easy of these rules. There's also the possibility that they maintain the guidance patrol, but that they just won, you know, similar to what you were mentioning about the Rouhani administration, even though I don't think it's true. But I think they might maintain it as an organization. They have some presence on the street, but they don't actually enforce the rules. That that could be also the case. Um, but I think, I mean, not in the short term, but in the long term, the Iranian society and also the government is moving in the direction of disbanding the, the guidance patrol. If I had to give a prediction, that might or might not age well, that, that is one of them. <laughs> well, there, the, you added that caveat so people can't use it. You were uncertain. It was just a speculation. Um, That's right. But thank you, Navid. I want to thank you so much for spending more than an hour with me, breaking all this stuff up and, and really explaining it for those who are very curious about what's happening inside Iran and why. Uh, I really appreciate, appreciate you joining me, and hopefully we can have you back on sometime soon. Thank you, Rania.